<laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to Ag with Emma. Um, today we're in Twin Falls, Idaho with Zane. He's my buddy I met at college, and I'll just give him the chance to introduce himself and what he does, who he works for, and all the fun he has. Do you want to take the tripod? Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, my name is Zane Moser. Um, I am a current a few of I student here at the Twin Falls, what would you call it, Ag Wing. Yeah. Doing my two plus two program with the Ag Bachelors in Communication, Science, and Leadership. Uh, currently, I work for the Harvey Cannell Ranch. Um, the family is the Cannell family here in Twin Falls. And we are a 4-H pig and a Dorper sheep facility. We also have a couple of dairy heifers for 4-H pig, or 4-H pigs, 4-H kids, I should say. Um, we have chickens, we have steers, we kind of have the whole nine yards, and uh, I'd like to give you guys a little tour today of what we do here. So, on this pen here, we have what's known as a Dorper breed. Dorp. Dorper breed is a smaller meat variety of sheep. Um, these guys, this is our weaning pen. This is the Weathers and the ewe lambs. We have them in here for about three, four months. Uh, we do sell the Weathers quite often at the Twin Falls Livestock Commission yard. And currently, the prices of sheep with this variety vary anywhere from oh, 175 to 200 dollars a head. Gotcha. Um, with this guy, or this guy, this variety, they're uh, woolless. They do have kind of a wool, but they don't have to be sheared every mm -hmm. year or however often you have to really shear the sheep, which is really convenient for like hobby farmers. In this case, small production operations. Yeah, that are really focused on just... Yeah, they're just focused yeah. on getting the meat. They're awesome mothers. They make fantastic milk. You can milk them. Okay. Um, I've milked a few here. Mm -hmm. Have I drank in it? Not really. Not really. Not I've a fan. I've tried it. It's, it's not bad. It tastes like sheep milk. Yeah, it's not cow milk. Definitely, they make awesome mothers with their lambs. Mm -hmm. um, I've raised Suffolk and Lancaster in years past in high school. Okay. And I didn't like them near as much. Like I'm not a sheep guy, but I am a I'm happy to have had the opportunity to work with them as much as I do. Yeah. And you learn a lot. Oh yeah. So you I've learned so much. You've already much taught here. me a lot that I didn't already know in the in 2 the, minutes that we've recorded. The past two years. <laughs> so they're with so these cute. Guys, they're perfect in the size for breeding too. Yeah. So a ram, and we have a pen of rams out back. I'll, I'll take you guys out there and show you. Perfect. The, the rams. But they're very docile. They're very easy to work with. Um, I can move this whole pen by myself in our catch pen in here. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll run them in this catch pen and I'll show you how this all works. Okay. Up. Right here behind the boys. Oh yeah. Mr. Steer and Mr. Steer 2. Kind of a uh, kind of pain, but uh, some days they're friendly a little bit. <laughs> I'm just excited. I'm gonna get butchers are pretty quick. They're gonna be yummy. They're gonna be very tasty. <laughs> and with our steers, for me, growing up in the Midwest, so originally I'm from southern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, we raised a lot of beef and I did a lot of dairy back there. So for me, I like feeding them good old corn, yeah. good old grain. They taste <laughs> better. The fat little marbleizes better on them. I'm not a grass fed kind of guy. Makes sense. Good old, good old corn. Give them what they need. We used to get. Uh, down in Chicago, there used to be a big commodity stockyard down there mm -hmm. for certain commodities and stuff. And one of the biggest things we used to get for about 200 bucks a semi truck load, about 13 yards, is yeah. called veggies. And veggies really was just processed, like byproduct of those veggie straws. Really? Like that. Yeah, like the, they're yeah. like, yeah. Same thing. So whatever was left after the process of making that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know it's either Frito-Lay or one of those big companies down there, but in Illinois, they had a big plant outside of Chicago in the Schaumburg area, they called it. And whatever was left over, they put out in these great big tubs. They put it online, be like, hey, we have a load this, this week for sale. Yeah. It'd be like 100 tons. And so that 100 tons would either go to pigs or it would go to dairy cows, it would go to beef operations. Uh, there was quite a few uh, poultry operations as well in northern Illinois okay. that it would go to and they just made a pretty good feed there wasn't a lot you know to really sort out because you had no idea what was in it exactly it could have been like beef yeah. it could be chunks of uh, lettuce tomatoes zucchini cucumber you mm -hmm. name it 
it's just animals months. using human byproduct, it which is cool. Fantastic. And it's, it's a cheap alternative feed, and you're not wasting feed. Exactly. You know, there's too much food in this world that's being wasted. Mm -hmm. Let's put it back. Let's give it to our livestock. Yeah, turn I think it that's into the protein. Yeah. So this is our catch pen. Perfect. And this thing is awesome. We just run the sheet down here. I'll close the shears back. I got a couple of gates like this one here. Okay. We just pop them open like such. Run the sheet through, close them. Mm -hmm. That's a gate that comes out, and then I can just run them one by one. Yeah. The reason we do this is it's a lot safer. It's a lot easier to handle the sheep to give them vaccinations. Mm -hmm. uh, we do our castration in here. We do our tail docking. Okay. When I I this other this is the other thing with the, the dorpers is their hooves grow pretty fast, and I think sheep in general do, but theirs seems to just grow a lot quicker. Yeah. I don't know why. I'm not a professional in that. But it's just how it, it is. It just is what it is. <laughs> but I trim them a lot, so in here it's really nice because I can sit, I can stand here pull the leg back yeah and then use my clippers or trimmers whatever i'm doing and it's easier on the animals a lot more safer and it's a lot gentle and they're not near as spooked and freaked out yeah not as stressed which is and it's it's really convenient that way so this is our catch pen we run all the sheep in here they've been doing this with sheep since the 1950s the family's been raising sheep and dairy cows here in this facility since the 1940s oh wow this barn is actually kind of neat so it's been each generation a certain section of the barn's been added okay um, that section over there's the parlor and then over here's the shop and everything and uh, throughout you know throughout the years um michael cannell he's the current owner of the farm and everything his dad was harvey cannell and so harvey helped create certain parts of the parlor and at one time there's only like five or six cows and then throughout the years i just built a bigger and bigger and better parlor yeah just like any dairy goes it just progresses and progresses as as needed and it seems like it's the only fitting thing that makes sense in this world because there's a demand every year each year grows yeah you have so much milk you can you gotta out. keep producing keep more so going, keep making money it's nice because you've got it's very family oriented here yeah um with the grandkids being involved he's got four grandkids two kids of his own who are currently involved in agriculture mm -hmm. and so it's nice to be around that because that's my passion is agriculture the same with mike and his kids and his grandkids yeah it's just to be family. involved in that yeah. it's like and a so we have all this common interest that we can share with each other i have a lot of different background and yeah work experience growing in the midwest because the midwest is a little bit different from the west just in, yeah, a few, exactly. <laughs> in a few concepts, if you can imagine. It's um, a different place for sure. Definitely different. You know, coming out here, out there we did silage a lot different. We didn't really do the... You yeah, know, the tarping with the tires. ...and pack it down. We just used upright silos. Yeah. And I used a couple of ag bags, and they were pretty nice. They just kept the feed from getting spoiled. And I personally will always be more biased towards the upright silo. I just, I like working in them. It's a nice aesthetic, too. It's like the farm aesthetic. It is. Silo, it makes yeah. it look nice, especially when they're clean, they're organized. A lot of them, depending on the dairy back there, some of the guys like to paint the roofs. So the roofs could be like a bicolor, white or yellow, white or yeah. blue. And then in turn, barns might be white and blue, white and red. Okay. The upright silo might have a couple of staves because that's what a lot of them are built out of is concrete staves. Mm -hmm. And then they're just put together and then... On the inside, you have a wall of concrete or porcelain that's sprayed on in the inside. Because when you're dumping your silage in there, concrete and something wet, yeah, eventually they kind of stick, exactly. especially in the winter time. So in the winter time, it it kind of sucked. You'd have to get up there and shovel your silage off the walls because mm -hmm. inside of them you have an unloader, and the unloader just kind of goes around in a circle, kind of like in a grain bin, kind of the same concept. And what it does is it has these teeth, and the teeth slowly grind up the silage, pull it through a little um, an impeller, kind of like a blower. And then on the side of the silage, you have a chute, and it shoots the silage on the chute, and it goes down either inside of a barn or onto yeah. a conveyor where it can go into a TMR. Um, what I really liked about those, there was hardly any spoilage. Yeah. You know, it, it fermented really well. You didn't lose hardly anything. It didn't go to waste. Makes sense.
The only problem is they're slow feeding. Yeah. You can't feed a lot of cows <laughs> out of one. Um, like a 60 foot, 16 by 60 foot, you could probably feed about 100 cows for about six months. Oh, okay. So that's Depend the benefit on, behind that. Yeah, it, yeah. Benefit, it's nice for smaller operations. But if you were to go over three, 400 cows. Yeah, I feed don't lots think out here couldn't do that. I don't yeah. think so. The 10,000 cow dairy here, there's no way. They couldn't use silos. So, I mean, it makes sense. It's it's the best they can do. And a lot of times they do a good job. They pack it good, yeah. cover it. There's a lot that goes into those pits. I don't think people understand. Yeah, and like, I didn't know it for the longest time. I had no idea. I was yeah. just like, what are these guys doing? Why are we throwing tarp Why and are tires? We? Like, <laughs> yeah. what is the point? But now that I see what actually goes on as far as conserving and helping the fermentation process take off, it makes sense. Yeah, that's handy to know because, like, I just did another silage video. So, so we we're at another sheep pen. Now this is a current breeding pen. There's about 65, 70 ewes in here. And there's a couple lambs. They were accidents. They weren't accidents. supposed to be. <laughs> um, we have a, a guy that is, he's, a, he's part of the family. Um, his name's Oliver Schroeder. He's over there in Nampa, Idaho. And he takes the sheep and runs them on his hop operation. So in order for a lot of these hop operations to stay organic, you know, they're not allowed to spray around the hops. And I guess hop, the plant itself, has a lot of shoots that grow out. Yeah. And from what he's been telling me, he's like, he puts the sheep on them and the sheep eat it down. Well, and I think hop offers quite a bit of nutritional benefit for the sheep. Mm hmm Because throughout the summer, he doesn't feed them a whole lot. He just kind of turns them loose. Of course, I think the hops are more of a grassier area. Yeah. So they're able to eat some kind of an orchard or a fescue grass. Yeah, because they, and... like, what is it called? Like, dual cropping when you, like, plant the hops? Because hops grow up. Yeah. And then they like cover it basically with a cover crop that protects the soil protects in between it. the And I'm pretty sure that's yeah. what he does. So whether he's got like an orchard grass or if he does Timothy, I have I really yeah. don't know. I need to ask him next time I see him what he does. But so for the most part the sheep that's that's where these guys typically go and then he breeds them, he buys quite a few. Um he's looking at buying this whole pen, I believe, here in the next few weeks. And then he'll ship them over there for the remainder of the year and feed them and clean up the hops. Makes take sense. care of the hops. And then I think that's what keeps the, the breweries happy, especially if they are an organic brewery and they're trying to stay that way. Yeah. And this is kind of the reason to help keep the, the hop operation organic. Makes a but, difference. Uh, yeah, this is the one pen. Then we have a pen of our own over there. Just a couple of ewes. We do have a couple of rams. Uh, the nice thing with the Dorper Rams is they're a lot smaller uh -huh. and they're so easy to handle. They're not aggressive, probably with each other more than anything. Yeah, they they're, look pretty they're mellow. They're pretty easy. They're very mellow to work with. Um, in fact, when I'm shearing, not shearing, but when I'm trimming the hooves, I can grab them, flip them over, sit on them. Yeah. Not choke them out or anything, but I can sit Not in an abusive gently. way, just like yeah. a control. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just enough that I can control them so I can trim their hooves without them getting hurt, without me getting hurt. And then they can be on their merry way. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about these guys, they typically don't get that big. So a full-grown Dorper Ram typically doesn't get more than 250 pounds. Oh, okay. And we had some that are close to 275, but that's that's not very common. It's a pretty thick one. <laughs> they, yeah, pretty, pretty stout. So another thing we're noticing here is that this used to be... A dairy. This was a dairy. And so this was a holding pen. Yeah. A corral at one time. So were you like? It's just that they use their pens to. I don't. You get all the wire in here that just converted the dairy from being a. Yeah. Go from a dairy, dairy to, to a lamb facility. without a lot of change, like without ripping everything out. But it's nice. And the only, the only thing we had to take out was the the headlocks. The headlocks. Yeah. It works pretty good with these guys. Just cool yeah, stuff this is to our, see. This is our ram pen. Then we had another pen of weathers and some ewe lambs over there. Okay, we, we kind of walked by that. We have certain age groups that we kind of like intermingle and move them around as needed. Okay, gotcha. Just so part of the rotation. Is, yeah, it's just it's exactly what it is. Just a little bit of a rotation. Move them around from pen to pen. Rotation and organizing. What's up? It's just the rotation and organization to improve the operation. Yep. So. That way they clean up, and they're a pretty good breed about cleaning up their hay. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is an oat hay I've been feeding. I fed this probably, what, two days ago? Yeah, they and clean I up. I give them about four or five flakes, and they just kind of sort through it. But 
The nice thing is I can come in with a rake, rake it into a pile, and they'll eat that same pile down. So it doesn't yeah. go to waste. Well, they'll eat anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that they do. We've had a few things out here that they've eaten that's made them sick. They'll eat kosher quite a bit. Oh, yes. But then there's another plant, and we're really not sure what the plant is. I don't know what it's called. I don't know all these Idaho native weeds because they're not near the same as they were in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> but there's one variety of weed that makes them... If they eat it, too much of it, it causes birth defects. Really? And we've had a few ewes that have gotten into this patch of whatever, eaten it. And uh, I've had a few lambs come out without a bottom jaw. Oh, okay. So around the head doesn't fully form inside of the, when they're inside the uterus mm -hmm. or whatever. I'm not a professional when in the production. When they're being <laughs> developed they're, within the yeah, mom. Yeah, when within <laughs> mom. And, uh... Whatever happens during those early stages of the fetus, they don't fully f develop. And there's been a few that have actually had two hooves on like the left hand side of the, the left rear. Mm -hmm. I had one with two hooves and then I had one a few weeks later. This was this past March and it was a ewe lamb and it had um, four hooves on one foot. What? It was it just it like, was like just, a flower petal. Like <laughs> It was so weird. I'd never seen it. And Mike and I were discussing this, and he says it's not real common, but there's a certain plant. He didn't know the name of it, and I'm going to find out eventually, and I can let you know. But whatever this plant is, it has something that doesn't coincide with whatever goes inside their rumen. Yeah. Because like a cow, sheep have a full rumen with reticulum, or abomasum, omasum. Whatever happens there, I have no idea. That's Why interesting. Why would you have a deformity like that? I don't know. If anyone knows what that weed is called, let me know. Comment. I'll let Zane know. I need to know. <laughs> Zane needs his own YouTube channel. He's good at this. Probably have to split this into two parts. There have we a go. doper. Have a, what? Have a couple. Have the dope. Uh, do dorper. Dorper, yeah. The, I Doperman. Know the Doperman sheep. Doperman. <laughs> <laughs> Dorperman. They're kind of a goofy deal. I, I think originally they come from some African breed. Oh, okay. They're mixed with like septic or something. I really don't know what they come from, but I know they're not um, an old world breed. I'm pretty sure they're a new world kind of type deal. Makes sense. Well, there's your dorpers. There they are. <laughs> that was a lot of education. That was a good some education. Yeah. Well, just a little. I feel like people are gonna learn about a lot of this and be pretty and shocked. We do. Yeah. And it's a pretty good little facility here. Um, I try to help keep everything maintained and organized, especially where we put our hay. So yeah. This stack here is oat hay. This is, I believe, our third cutting, first, third or second cutting um, from one of the, the fields the family owns over here. And then we have an alfalfa cutting on the other side from last year. We're trying to finish off considering how expensive hay is this year. Yeah, hay is through the roof. But uh, thanks to the, uh, the Williams family, that end up farming all the ground around here. That's Casey and Tell Williams. They do a phenomenal job farming. They do. They help supply a lot of our hay, and there's a there's a little bit of sharecropping going on. But they actually farm all this ground back here. That was a silage cornfield this year. Um, this is all technically the canal farm ground around here, up to Casey's land on that side. But Casey farms all of it. Okay. And so in return, we get I think half or a third of the cutting. Of the gotcha. alfalfa or oat hay or whatever is going on. Just works out like that. It works perfect. They're a good family and it's good to work with them. Good people. Yeah. Really beneficial to the community. Absolutely. Good neighbors. So Good neighbors, especially in the ag industry, makes a whole heck of a difference. That's really what keeps it going, in my opinion. But. And without it, well, you don't want to talk to them. Yeah. I wouldn't want to talk. <laughs> yeah. If they were bad neighbors, I wouldn't want to talk to them. It's like you like, can't you network can with them. and. Thing. Yeah, work with them so with yeah well good stuff to know all right guys in order to keep the youtube videos a little shorter we're going to split zane's interview into two parts so stay tuned for part two that has their 4-h pigs and a little bit more to the farm in it so thanks for watching subscribe and like to watch part two as soon as it's out